is the breakfast and plus TV Africa time for of the press as always we'll take you through the pages of our national dailies and our focus would be on the big stories this morning we have Chris Kende Wandu who joins the conversation it's good to have you join us Chris good morning good morning thanks for having me and happy new month happy new month Chris thank you so much we appreciate your time uh, let's start off with the Guardian newspaper uh, this morning as we look at all the papers uh, being made available by the paper vendor. On the Guardian newspaper this morning, Adamu panel asks for time. February 26, APC convention, shaky. Uh, one would be thinking that the all progressive Congress should have their acts together, uh, being the ruling party. But let's see how things unfold for the APC. Efforts to reconcile uh, grieve chieftains inclusive Inconclusive, I beg your pardon. We will carefully study interim report of committee. Uh, uh, that's also another rider there. National Assembly transmit reworked electoral bill to Buhari for assent. INEC raises security concerns and vows to disqualify erring parties. Away from that caption, you also have Balogun. Others withdraw suits and postpone Ibadan chieftaincy declaration review uh, also on the Guardian newspaper this morning. Terrorists kill 12 and raise homes in Katsina. And just before we move away, Amechi announces delay in rail projects as China suspends funding. Customs immigration raises alarm as revenue loss threatens 17 trillion naira in the 2022 budget. That's it on the Guardian newspaper. Let's uh, uh, breath with the uh, Punchy newspaper this morning and we begin with the leading headline there. Still on the APC um, convention, like the Guardian had. APC February convention and setting. Peace panel demands extension and with the following writers. Petition still being submitted. We need one week more, says committee chair. Another writer, APC registers 41 million members. Governor's rule, governor rules out convention postponement. Uh, so we're going to see if that convention really hold. Can't wait for our guests' uh, thought on that. At the top of the Punch newspaper, the following headlines. Malami to decide electoral act bill. Malami to decide electoral act bill. National Assembly transmits document to Buhari. 243 firms jostle for CBN's multi-billion Naira loan scheme. Okorcha unveils presidential bid, Knox zoning, ex-governor charged with 2.9 billion Naira fraud. As we called it, a roller coaster of a day for him yesterday. Still with the Punch newspaper, Senate projects 3 trillion Naira revenue for agencies, customs, faults, finance bill. National Assembly threatens sanctions against MDAs over secret lopsided recruitment. National Assembly threatens sanctions against MDAs over secret lopsided recruitment. Let's uh, go to the bottom of that front page. 98 suspected political thugs arrested by soldiers in a kitty arraign. That's uh, a, a, quite a number, 98 suspected political thugs. Those probing or pushing for polls without restructuring are political criminals. Ghani Adams, he's not spoken for a while. Those pushing for polls without restructuring are political animals, he says. Landowner returns Unilag's lecturers 6 million naira after a punch report. Alleged arsonists touch Obasanjo's 2.420 hectare Benue farm. Gunmen rob beat firemen well wow, those are the firemen who came to quench the fire oh my at that particular farm it's really sad fear grips equity community over influx of herdsmen farms deserted human parts found with me for my ex-boss promising 30 million dollar reward driver uh okay okay and finally efcc detains medview airline boss for alleged 900 thousand dollar hajj fraud those are the headlines coming from the punch newspaper away from the punch newspaper this morning let's look at the leadership and on the leadership newspaper civil society organization stakeholders give president muhammad buhari seven days to sign electoral bill 
that's very bold and might just be dominating some of the papers this morning. Say INEC needs legal framework to issue 2023 elections guideline and legislature has done its part, says Lawan. Northern youths weren't governors and others. You remember Festus Okoye saying that internal mechanism of, you know, the umpire, that's INEC, would actually allow INEC to go ahead with the guidelines, whether or not you have this bill being passed. Except, you know, I didn't get him. NAS gives revenue agencies 3 trillion IR uh, target for 2022 budget. Uh, just uh, almost the same with the, uh, you know, the, the plan to spend 3 trillion IR for a subsidy, fuel subsidy. So yeah, I don't know what that means. Troops and police kill 28 terrorists and rescue 30 in Sokoto and Zamfara. That's what you find. CBN funds 28 coins with 23.2 billion naira under 100 for 100 policy. And away from that, Nigeria, United Kingdom hold fast security dialogue. Forex scarcity threats to Nigeria's short-term growth. And just before we move away from the leadership newspaper, APC Reconciliation Committee submits interim report and asks for more time. So the issue of having the convention on 26th of February is quite um, shaky, as has been described by the papers. But that's the much we can take on the leadership this morning. Let's, uh, uh, Fali, we take the headlines from the Daily Trust um, newspaper, they call it the paper you can trust, they have the leading headline, nine um, with a kicker, nine years after, banks battle discos over 820 billion naira debts, uh, the following writers, employees decry salary backlog others, neck to half owner manager regime sources, little to show in increased electricity supply and investors overpaid poorly managed discos experts. Um, this one I take personal, you know, and uh, because of uh, what I had suffered under the Port Hackett Electricity Distribution Company. And uh, yesterday I saw that there was a, there was a story from Calabar where cross riverians were asking um, uh, the government authorities to do something about PHD, probably seize their license, as was done in another uh, distribution company in Nigeria. It's, it's quite, quite sad because uh, uh, consumers, uh, customers of these distribution companies are going through a lot. Uh, at the top of a Daily Trust front page, tariff dispute, NHIS brokers truce between healthcare providers, uh, HMOs. Bandits kill nine in Sakoto, Kaduna, Niger, abduct 50 in Katsina village. Really sad. Senate gets three trillion naira target for revenue agencies. And uh, let's check out the story at the bottom of that front page. How IPOB killed Herda, shot Igbo man's 30 cows. That's a, sort of an irony. How IPOB killed Herda, shot Igbo man's 30 cows. Um, my animals worth 30 million era, Peter Onyado. Late Herda spent 20 years working for Igbos, killing despicable Mieti Allah. And uh, finally, National Assembly transmits reworked electoral bill to Buhari. NMPC seeks energy transition investments, targets low carbon economy, and APC chairmanship. Unity stability will be my bond, Senator Musa. And uh, that's the last uh, paper we have. Let's uh, get into the think of things um, with um, uh, our guest, Chris Kainde Nwandu, who's a chartered mediator and conciliator. Mr. Nwandu, good morning to you, and uh, thanks for joining us once again. Good morning. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, I, I, I described you last time as a tribal as Nigerian, of course, because of your name. Um, so let's, let's, let's start with the, um, the story on the, on the killing of a headsman. Uh, by allegedly by IPOB members and uh, uh, the, the 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 discovery that those cows belong to an Igbo man. I mean, how does that work out? It's quite unfortunate uh, uh, that such will happen uh, because uh, I, I don't know any reason why uh, IPO allegedly was still within the realms of allegations. I don't know uh, whether it was IPO that actually did it or not, uh, but. Let us even assume that it's IPOP members. It's quite unfortunate. Uh, whether it's a, a yes man from any part of the country, or Igbo, or Aos, or whatever, the killing of any person uh, is regrettable and is condemned in its totality. 
Then moving further, you went to they went ahead to kill 30 cows. That is the livelihood of somebody. And they went ahead to kill. Let us even look at it from the point of um, the directive that allegedly came from there. They gave a time frame, quote and unquote, as to when um, cows from other parts of the country must not be seen within the south. Is as we got into that, I think it's April or June or something. I can't remember the particular date now. So why killing, um, uh, slaughtering those uh, cows, 30 cows? You know what that means? That is an investment by somebody. Practically, people, the economic uh, fortune of the person, the owner. And the person came out to be an evil man like you. So I wouldn't know the reason behind that. And uh, I, I think it's that time our security agency step up there. Um, that's a uh, uh, net to be able to make sure that all those involved in that are, are arrested and um, brought to book. But it's quite unfortunate. Um, the soul of the header rest in peace from the report who said the guy has been living with them, with them for over 20 years, uh, so he's practically a, a part of that society, he's part of that community. So, why would anybody want to go and go ahead? And see him? It's quite unfortunate uh, where we find ourselves, but um, uh. <laughs> This, to me, is becoming very unbecoming. There's any language like that. Uh, but, but it always comes as a surprise to uh, some people that um, uh, such cows could belong to an evil man. And that, that's the irony. I mean, how does that play out? Is, is this, is this uh, rare? Because the idea is that, oh, these cows are from, for Fulani men, you know, people from the north, and they're coming down south. There's not only uh, Fulani men. I'm from Imo State. And if you go to a place like Kokigwe uh, in Imo State, you realize that and that community is noted for um, its cow selling of cows and beef, me and the rest of them. So there are Igbos and other parts of the Nigerians who also get involved. That they might not be not in the quantum that you see with Polanis or those from North. There are, there are some Igbos that are also into the art of um, selling cows. And uh, as I rightly said, uh, if you go to Okigwe, uh, Imo State, where I come from, from Imo State, I'm from Imo State. I know that within that region of Okigwe, there is a lot of um, Hausa communities that already mingle uh, with Igbos and Igbos get involved in the religion. and if you go to the abattoirs in the Igbo land <laughs> all the butchers are Igbo, Igbo people I have never seen an Hausa butcher in, in, in the whole of the Southeast if you go to the market, the people that send Nama as we call it, in the Southeast are Igbos and they are the ones that also kick cows I have never seen an Hausa man killing cow in my village in Obo, where I come from when you go to the market, you see the Igbo just like even if you go to the south or Lagos, where if you go to the Abatio here in Ebeda or what's that place where you have it, it's Yorubas that kick cows. You see that most of them, the owners of those cows, are also um, Yorubas. There are businesses where you see them going as far as the north to buy those cows and bring them to the southwest. So it's not only um, uh, northerners that those cows are rare cows, but only that they are in the majority. But other Nigerians also get involved in the, in the business of um, cow and um, cow to last it well. Okay, so um, Chris uh, Kende Mwandu, let's also look at the leadership newspaper this morning. The issue of the electoral bill is still dominating the pages of our dailies, and almost every day we still have the conversation. Now, um, uh, NAS transmit the bill to the president. Civil society organization and stakeholders are giving the president seven days to sign the electoral bill. Do you see, you know, the bill being signed within the period of seven days? And what happens if the bill is not signed in seven days? Well, everybody, every Nigerian or any day of petition have the rights to say um, or express their view concerning any issue. So the CSOs and stakeholders, uh, as you mentioned, have the right um, to say or um, give a certain ultimatum. But uh, what constitutional rights do they have to give such uh, uh, ultimatum? Is it within the constitution? Is there anywhere in the constitution that it says that they must give the president seven days or to make sure to sign it? To me, that is not a light of, light, line of thought for now. The fact is that we should get the president to sign that and as, do that as quickly as possible because INEC in itself is waiting for that to be signed so that they can start uh, preparing for the forthcoming election. A lot of things uh, ensure we did that, uh, that uh, bill. Uh, electronic transmission of results and so many other things. So it's not just about the direct or indirect primaries that um, has come to uh, people have come to identify with that. Bill. There are so many other things. And I think I've said that except that bill is signed, that it may be difficult for us to be able to roll out 
the sensitivities or plans for the 2023 election. Don't also forget that we have some uh, staggered election coming up in the next few weeks uh, or months um, in Ekiti and some other states. So um, the president should now have no reason not to sign because he gave specific instruction as to why he didn't sign that, uh, that bill. And I think that National Assembly has done the need. Um, we're also reading that it has been sent to the president and also as the AGF. Uh, and we're looking forward that in the next few months, the president will give Nigerians any reason not to sign that because he has done that in the past about two or three times. Those bills were passed even before the 2029 uh, election. I gave the reason that uh, one of the reasons gave was that it was too close to an election period. Now we have over a year to go into the election, so he wouldn't give any reason. I'm looking forward that in the next few days we'll be able to sign off on the bill so that we can start making preparation for the 2023 election. All right. All right, Chris, and just before you know, I hand you over to Kofi, let's also look at another very dicey issue here. The excuse that the civil society and stakeholders are making is the fact that uh, INEC needs the legal framework so they can issue the guidelines uh, for the 2023 elections. And I remember some time on this platform, we had uh, the uh, we had Festus Okoye, who is actually the commissioner of uh, voter information, or voter education uh, spokesperson. And he said that uh, the internal mechanisms are, you know, of the umpire could allow the, uh, you know, the umpire to go ahead to issue these guidelines, as well as falling back, you know, to, to the previous act. Yes, I've mentioned it. If, um, I just mentioned it. That was what I said. I said that this act needs to be signed into law so that INEC can start preparation for the 2023 election. I think that's how I took my statement. And I think that um, once that is done, then um, the president, INEC has no other option or reason not to go ahead with the preparation for the 2023. They have to roll out timetable, they have to roll out modalities. There's going to be training. Don't forget, there are also going to be con this various convention that's going on is part of the preparation towards the 2023 election. So the political parties have to have a time frame as to when to hold their convention, when to um, elect, uh, select their presidential candidates, governorship candidates, and various. Uh, so it's a very 2022 is a very very choked year already. We already so, we are in February after today. The question here is, without the president assenting to this bill, can I next go ahead with issuing the guidelines for the elections? They are already stipulated. Of course, I next can go ahead. It doesn't have that. It's not to say that I next must stop. Uh, there's already a, there's a bill that was in place. I, I, I next has this art. That's what is called the uh, electoral art. Or the, and yes, which the I next has been operating even right from 1999 to um, 2015 to 20. That's the... That's, uh, INEC has an ask, so it doesn't have to wait for the president. What is only really saying that most of the modalities and some of the new innovations that you want to put into play, which will help future election, are already embedded and not well captured in those last act, in the, 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 uh, the act they are using now, which is why they want the president. But if the president does not um, uh, refuse to sign it, then what is it going to do? It doesn't mean that INEC will not conduct election. Definitely, INEC will conduct election. There are two ways to reach. If the president to refuse to sign it, then the National Assembly has the right to override the, 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 the president on that. They have that right. And so all they need to do is to come together and give the president has a certain number of days to sign the bill. That is why when I was saying, when I saw the report seven, giving the president seven days, that is not the law. The law says that once a bill is passed to the president by the National Assembly, that is a time frame. I can't remember the number of days now. If that number of, I think it's about 30, 60, or I can't remember the number of days now. If that day, those days last, then the National Assembly will record that bill and pass it with or without the consent of the president. So it's neither here nor there. If the president doesn't, they can override it and we move on. And it becomes law, whether the president signs it or not. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Wandu, let, let's quickly, before we move on to the next uh, headline, uh, stay with this for a while. Look at the, the role of um, uh, uh, Abu Bakr Malami in, in all of this. Um, for some people, they might be a bit uh, apprehensive seeing the headline from the Punch newspaper, Malami to decide electoral act bill uh, as national necessary transmits document to Buhari. Um, but, but, but it's not as bad as it seems because he actually gives what we call a legal opinion uh, on the bill. He did it um, with the first one that was transmitted to the president and uh, he wrote a letter advising uh, President Buhari against signing the Electoral Act because of the controversial uh, direct primaries clause. Um, so so, so what, what do you think of his role in all of this? Malami's um, role is that of, is, 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 what the president said is his legal opinion, is the Attorney General of the Federation, he's his adversary. 
the president doesn't have to take what Malami says. There is nowhere in the book where the president must take uh, um, everything that is coming out from the office of the AGF. So, um, if he advises the president and give uh, reason why certain uh, clauses or session uh, within the past uh, bill, uh, the president should answer to then the president also to have to listen to him to a large extent. But he does not; he has no final say on that. The final person that can sign up on that. Don't forget, this, Malami is not the only person that advises the president. There are so many. The president has political advisors. He has uh, other advisors who also are legal advisors, not just AGF. The presidency itself have legal advisors. So it's not just the AGF. So the, the AGF can only, the, we cannot be waiting on the AGF. He will do his role, he plays his role. And um, don't forget that to a large extent, the AGF is also a politician. That is why we have always said there should be a distinction between the office of the, AGF, the Attorney General of the Federation and, uh, uh, and the Minister of Justice. Ever and over again, we have said that, that those two offices should be separated so that one will be manned by a strictly poli a, a, a politician, if, as the case may be, then the other by a professional. But when you merge the two together, politics come into play. And, um, the AGF has never, all the AGFs have never hated the matter. They are members of the ruling political parties, and that, at times, most of the advice they give tends to, tend, tend to tie to, um, towards the pol their political parties uh, that they belong to. So, but he's, as I said, is going to be adversary. He's going to advise the president on it. But the president doesn't have to wait for the okay. AGF uh, or take everything that the AGF says to be able to sign the bill or not. Interesting. We hear this time, um, according to the point chief, I still with that headline, um, that uh, their sources are telling them, they are saying their sources are telling them that the president may also consult the uh, Nigerian Communications Commission as regards to the issue of electronic transmission of votes. Are we not past that? that point at this time we have passed that point and i hope that is not going to be another way of delaying the signing we don't forget that why is he consulting the ncc again ncc we are part of um, uh, those that um, uh, we are part of in the course of um, uh, the bill where the bill was tabled before the national assembly uh, we went through the committee stage and stakeholders all stakeholders Came to make their inputs, and uh, uh, NCC was one of the stakeholders, and they made their input, and they gave reason um, why they think that uh, that should fly. Initially, don't forget that there was a time it was a big political. They were trying to say, "Oh no, there are certain areas that cannot be covered," and the rest of them. And after some time, they came back again to say, "No, we can do this. Uh, this electronic transmission uh, of results is not as uh, technical." Um, as some people make it to believe. It's just like your normal SMS. You can send SMS wherever, where, from wherever you're in part of this country. So uh, I think we've gone past that. And the SEC has um, given its own, uh, has given its own, uh, or have made its own recommendation when it comes to that. And as far as I'm concerned, I think we've gone beyond that. The president doesn't need to consult uh, NCC or whoever again. What he was specific in what he wanted. Um, and they, what he stated in the last, don't forget, he gave reasons, about three or four reasons why he feel that a portion of that bill should not be, he cannot sign it. Chiefly, the area of um, the primaries of the political parties. And what's the point that then he has no reason not to sign that into law again? Okay, just as we quickly coasted down this morning on the paper review, uh, let's quickly share your thoughts on this one. It's on the Guardian newspaper. By the way, Rotimi Amechi announces delay in real project as China suspends funding. So it feels like, you know, the world project in Niger will probably just have to, you know, be paused because China has actually suspended funding of this project. That's what's happened. Who, who goes uh, uh, borrowing, go uh, begging. So <laughs> we went, we went uh, borrowing. The, we are within the, uh, within the space of any country that we decide or any organization we decide, if they decide not to give us again, oh well, I, wouldn't, I don't know the reason, I've not read that story. I don't know the reason given by the minister uh, for the suspension of bed. I believe that there will always be a bilateral agreement on issues like that. Uh, it's a contract, as we say in law. A contract is a, a contract. Uh, and if it's a valid contract, uh, as also we say in law, it's uh, signed, sealed, and delivered as far as concerned. So that is a, that is a valid contract in law. So if you have an agreement and as a, a valid contract signed with China as issue relating to those issues of um, those funds, then China has not shown that to except they are, within the clause, there are certain things that in this is they've seen that because wanting you to sign a contract, 
But if you breach that contract, then I, as a, as a party to that contract, have a right to renege on the contract. So if there's nobody else that they feel that Nigeria has reneged on, and based on that, they are not releasing necessary funds that are supposed to be then. But the concern is, should we be, as a country, boring to you know finance critical infrastructure? I mean, let's just even not even go by that particular story now. Should we be borrowing to finance critical infrastructure such as, uh, you know, the real project? There's no country in the world that doesn't borrow. United States of America borrow, United Kingdom borrow, Russia borrow, Germany borrow, every, all the countries of the world, South Africa, as good as the economy, borrow money. But what our own problem, my problem with that is that we will channel those money that we borrow into the right projects that we are used to. And that has always been most of them are not to borrow and share the money or they are embezzled and the rest of them. That's nothing wrong. One is to borrow. Another thing is also to channel is because when you borrow for capital projects, then you invest in that capital project, they're supposed to be yield back the funds for you to pay back. That is how it is that is the difference between Nigeria and other countries that borrow. They borrow, go and see what Rwanda is doing. Go and see the level of infrastructure in Rwanda. Yes, they borrow to be able to repair. You see that those what most of the infrastructures are yielding huge dividends and be able to be able to pay back. Go to Ghana also to support their doing. So, but our own is that we say we are borrowing, we are borrowing. At the end of it, so if you don't borrow, no businessman, even Dangote, is the richest man in Africa. Uh, Messi, I will tell you that Dangote borrows money. If borrow, Dangote cannot run his company without borrowing. There is no company that run without borrowing. The fact is that the money you are borrowing, are you utilizing it for the day? But it does not sustain necessarily that you must rely 100% on borrowing. We also have a way of generating income. We sell crude oil. Are we not making money from our crude oil? We're also talking about the sensitive other sectors of the economy, mining, agriculture, and so many other sectors where we think we can be able to make, uh, make money and foreign exchange. Right. But we are not doing that. We depend so solely we on crude oil. And that's where the problem is. All right. Uh, it's, I think it's, 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 it's already in, on record that the, uh, the federal government has said, you know, this is a model, a uh, revenue model for the rail sector, and they have where the money is going to come from. Um, so it's been interesting time to see if the issues with the, the, the loans can be sorted out so Nigeria can, can really enjoy uh, the rail services uh, as well. Um, Chris Kende Wando is a chartered mediator and conciliator. You've been a, an analyst this morning on Off the Press. I want to thank you very much for your time and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much for having me. I do have a nice day ahead. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Mercy, um, it's time to look at what happened. Today is the first day of February 2022. The year is running. We're running very fast. Very fast. We have to look at what's happened today in history right here on Plus TV Africa. And when we return, we have more. We'll definitely head straight to our major conversation. When we come through, we will be revealing all of that. Please stay with us.